Hi everyone um, and welcome to today's session. Thanks for joining today um, and I really hope that you enjoy the webinar. So my name is Adam Harding. I'm one of the HR advisors here at iTeam um, and the webinar that I will be presenting today is Disciplinary Do's and Don'ts. Uh, I'll just let you know that a recorded version of this webinar will be available and a link will go out to everyone that's signed up. Okay, so the agenda. So essentially what we're going to be looking at is to discuss really an overview of employee rights relating to a fair dismissal process. We're going to look at and highlight risks of not conducting a full and fair investigation. Excuse me. And we're also going to explore how Idilio team provides useful policies and template letters to help practices comply with their legal obligations. As you would have noticed, I'm not going to talk about exactly what's on the slides because you can read those as we go along. Okay, next slide then. Okay, so let's have a look at the overview of, of the procedure. So disciplinary is really a management tool. Um, so like a formal way for an employer to deal with an employee's unacceptable or improper behavior, such as a misconduct. It is important to be fair and consistent. The staff do need to know what the rules are, so make sure that they're easily accessible. Um, I think it's important probably just to say that before you start down a disciplinary route, you should first see whether you can resolve it in an informal way. Um, so this can often be quite the, the, the swiftest and easiest solution. So you might want to try fixing the issue with the employee by uh, talking privately to them and any other staff involved listening it's definitely listening to their point of view um, and also maybe agreeing to any improvements that can be made so if the informal route doesn't work out you've had that conversation and you think actually it's just it's not it hasn't resolved it so you have to go down or you're considering going down an informal a formal procedure it should be a last resort remember it's not really a stick to beat people with it's more of, of, a, of a tool to correct behavior and then manage risk to your business when all attempts to resolve a disciplinary issue through informal counseling have failed this is when you'd start to go through these steps so this wave and the right time to, to implement to be where you've provided maybe several informal warnings. Uh, a common one could be for lateness or maybe an issue with person's uniform. Um, check, are there notes on their file? It's always a good idea to record these as they'll form part of the investigation when you, when you progress through the process. If you've considered trying to resolve this issue informally, but you feel you need to start a disciplinary procedure, you must tell the employee straight away. You should do it in writing. Um, and it should include sufficient information about the alleged misconduct, any possible consequences, for example, could there be a potential written warning? The employee should also have information in time to prepare for a disciplinary hearing. We'll see more about that as we go through these slides. Always make sure to follow a fair and thorough um, and, and, and full process throughout. Um, this is for the protection, not just of the employee, but also for you and ultimately your business. The ACAS, so the ACAS code of conduct um, is a minimum that your business should be following. You might have your own code or you might have your own policy that might have some dis differences that better suits your workplace. Um, but just remember that ACAS are there as a very minimum standard. Um, so even though ACAS isn't law, um, if a disciplinary would or could reach an employment tribunal, judges will actually take into consideration whether or not the employers followed the ACAS code and in a fair way. It's an important note to make that actually if you fail to follow the ACAS code of practice, you could potentially be adding up to 25% increase on a tribunal claim. So it's quite an important lesson there. Right, next slide. So we're going to be looking at actually what is a misconduct. So misconduct is when an employee's inappropriate behavior or action actually breaks workplace rules that you would have stipulated in a policy, maybe in your handbook. The most common ones uh, I also would have seen on your screen, such as poor timekeeping, minor breaches of policy or procedure, absent without leave, if there's potential bullying that's going on, um, and also insubordination, so refusing to do tasks that you set them. 
an employee could face disciplinary action for misconduct as well as um, for outside work. So, for example, when an employee's behavior in front of external clients at the work Christmas party reflects badly on the company. Now, it does depend on how serious the employer sees that misconduct and actually whether it, it did have a bad effect on the business. It's important to make sure that you carry out a thorough investigation um, and you need to kind of you need to show that there's been an impact and what that impact has been on the business should you go down that route. Now, moving on to gross misconduct. Gross misconduct, you need to define it. Uh, it's behavior on the part of the employee, which is so bad that it destroys the employer employee working relationship um, and merits instant dismissal without notice or pay in lieu of notice. So I think the, the term essentially there is a summary dismissal. It's best to make it absolutely clear what you consider to be gross misconduct. Um, so make it clear in your policy. If you have a code of conduct, make sure it's clear in there. And also, again, make sure it's clear in the staff handbook. Common or common um, definitions or causes for a gross misconduct charge could be things such as like a false GDC registration number, fake DBS, theft or fraud, physical violence or bullying, deliberate or serious damage of property, serious insubordination, unlawful discrimination or harassment, uh, as things such as bringing the organization into disrepute um, and serious breach or repeated breaches of health and safety rules. So disciplinary process, what is the process? So you've got your allegation, your allegation and your suspicion of something that's happened. You'd conduct your full and fair investigation. You've got then your invite to hearing. You have the hearing. There's an outcome at the end. They have a right to appeal. You need to have a reasonable belief that any offense has been committed. Um, and it's also important to note here that if you do not follow all these stages, it cannot, it can be seen as an automatically unfair process. So you have to go through the stages. There are, I'm afraid, no shortcuts. Right, so going down the formal route, the first place is your investigation. So this is a key part of the process. And Typically, it's actually a lot, lots of people fail this at the tribunal for not carrying out the stage. So get advice. Don't delay too long for the incident. Give us a call. We're here to help you. Call us not when you're going through the process and, you, and, you, and you're halfway through and you realize actually that you may have made a mistake or you've skipped a step. Call us at the beginning. Let us give, us, give you the advice that you need. Tell the employee that you're investigating and why in writing. Prepare. So it's who's the best person to carry out the investigation list out your witnesses um, and order them do not rush rush into this process be considered um, be thoughtful is what's the most appropriate way of dealing with the situation and also make sure that for the investigation prepare open-ended questions remember it's a fact-finding exercise it's not interrogation you're looking at both sides of this as part of the procedure. And the person investigating should be finding out if there's an issue that needs to be addressed. You're not trying to prove guilt. Now, with witness statements, a, a common one with witness statements are, can they be anonymous? The short answer is yes, but, and it's a big but, it's only in exceptional circumstances, um, as you can actually impact the outcome of the tribunal. It's worth noting that with anonymity, um, you cannot, and you, you need to be forthright really, you cannot guarantee anonymity if it were to go to tribunal. So just to make sure that that person's aware when providing that witness statement. Physical evidence, refer to their staff file. Are there any previous informal notes that you may have made at, a, at an earlier stage that could be used? to maybe paint a picture of, is there a pattern, for instance? Is there, what about the social media page? Is there, you're looking for evidence. And just make sure that it's reasonable and fair. So it's really hard, I think, when you may be involved, not to take it personally, but just try to th step back um, and think of all sides. Okay. Now, in some situations, you're going to get through to suspension. 
Now, normally with suspension, it's full pay and benefits. You need to think about how you're going to suspend and when it's appropriate to suspend, and it shouldn't be used as a form of appropriate, a form of punishment, sorry. Make sure to put it in writing. Be clear on how long you expect the duration for the suspension to last, um, and always have a, a key contact, point of contact for that individual. Um, and I think just the key takeaway with suspension is it does not infer guilt. It is there as a tool for you to effectively manage the practice. So actually inviting someone to a hearing. You've, you've conducted your investigation stage. You feel actually that you, you do have enough grounds to, to pursue a formal hearing. What do you include? So I think points for you just to be mindful of when you are inviting someone to a hearing are notice. So they need notice to attend this hearing. I think a reasonable time would be as a minimum, maybe two to three days. They do have the right to be accompanied by a trade union rep or a colleague. Um, it's really an opportunity for them just to state their case. You, have, you, you provide them with all the relevant documentation. So effectively, that's your evidence you would have collated during your investigation stage. Make sure to include a date, kind of a key one, um, also a venue and who's on the panel. Now, you should also include there the possible outcome. And I got to stress the word possible here. Remember that no decision has been made. It's not a foregone conclusion. You won't, they will not, you're, they're going in to state their case. They're not going in there just to hear what you've already sanctioned them with. So just make sure that there's no decision that has been made until after the hearing. I wanted just to draw on as well the right to be accompanied because I think that this is, this is one when people can often, they misunderstand what the role is. So as I said in the previous slide, the right to be accompanied, it can be a, a work colleague or a trade union rep. Now, this legal right applies to the formal hearing stage. Um, you may feel actually for whatever reason unique to that situation that the person may request a, a colleague to a, a, or someone to accompany them in the investigation stage if you when you interview them. That's up to you. Sometimes it's appropriate. Um, I think if it's not an unreasonable request, there's no real reason to, to deny them, but they do not have that legal right. It's only applicable um, for their formal hearing. I think as well, failure to allow an employee their rights can result in compensation, and that can be two, up to two weeks pay plus the 25% on top for not following ACAS code. So again, remember, don't skip a step. Um, call us as well, I think, uh, if you're in doubt. A fellow colleague cannot be compelled to attend um, as a companion. Um, with trade union reps, ask for credentials, make sure they are who they say they are. And yeah, just generally the employee's request has to be reasonable. Now, the role of the companion, um, as I said earlier, that is a common mistake um, is made with this. That they think that actually that person is there as moral support and then they just sit there and stay silent throughout the whole process. But actually, they can address in the hearing. They can help the employee with their case. They can summarize points. They can ask questions. They can respond on the employee's behalf to a a views expressed, but they cannot answer questions directed to that employee. Um, but there's nothing stopping them from conferring or even requesting an adjournment if they need to. Okay, so you've invited them to the hearing. The actual hearing then takes place. So it's important, I think, going in to know, well, who's on the hearing part? Who's on that panel? What are their roles? It's an opportunity for that individual to state their case. Like I said, after looking through all the evidence um, as you're going through, make written notes on all the responses. And it is important not, to, again, not to prejudge any outcome. If new evidence is brought to light during that hearing, it's best to adjourn it. Um, so it gives you time then to reflect on that new evidence if you think that actually that could impact on the outcome. Um, also, keep a full written record. Some members may ask if they can record the meeting with a dictaphone or even their phones. 
that's only okay if both parties agree. So you, whoever's conducting that hearing has to agree. They can't just have a recording device and not tell you about it. Now, you've had your hearing, what about the outcome? Now, the, you do not have to give an outcome there and then. In fact, I probably would recommend that you don't. You end the, end the hearing, you go away, you, you review it, you look at the notes, take in all the evidence and what the statement says, and then you deliver that outcome in writing. Remember that they do have the right to appeal. So, and this is also a common mistake where people forget to include that part when they're actually talking about the outcome. So remember that they do have the right to appeal. And if you, need, if, they, if you need to, for whatever reason, if there's an illness or they suddenly can't make it, you can reschedule the hearing. Okay. I wanted us to take a moment here to talk about document storage, which I think is especially important with procedures such as a disciplinary hearing. So you need to have safe and secure document storage. So while there's no issue with storing documents in hard or paper copies, uh, the key really is to make sure that you have the information on file. Now, we are speaking to a lot of practices who are moving away from traditional paper files for security purposes, to save space in their practice because all the filing cabinets they might have in the way. Um, it's also a tool to make life easier. Um, and the type of information that we hear, uh, well, that we get told about a lot is the, this is all of these things that you have in FR, all the things you actually end up chasing team members for. So for RI team members, documents are obtained in accordance with the staff file checklist. They can all be uploaded to the ITEAM application and stored electronically. Um, it's a cloud-based system, so it's password protected for security also means that it's easy accessible in the event that you need that information, for example, evidence for a hearing. There's also functionality for reminders on your system to, to prompt you um, to obtain new documents when they're going to expire. So for instance, your GDC registration certificates, your indemnities, etc. cetera. Um, it'll also make remembering for renewals of documents so you, you're chasing. It's that much easier and acts as a prompt for you. Um, these reminders also go to team members, so they can do this on behalf of the practice. I think as well, it's really important. Now, when, if and when should ever you ever need to take a disciplinary hearing, the last thing you want to be doing is worried or stressing that there are gaps in an employee's record that you may need to use for evidence or if you're looking for evidence for a pattern. So there's also functionality on both iComply and iTeam for documents to be sent to team members to review with a read acceptance functionality. So team members can electronically confirm that they have read a document, such as a policy document. So which is handy for circumstances where individuals claim ignorance for rules, for instance. Now, team members can upload some documents for you. So this creates the right impression from the start of the engage uh, and, and gets them engaged with the process and helps to demonstrate that you're a progressive practice to work for. So if you think that this might be a practical solution for you, um, especially with regards to HR, um, then get in touch. We can arrange a demo. We can show you how, how it would work and how user friendly it is. And then you can decide if, if actually that's something that you might want to take us up on. Now, going on from document storage and all the correct, correct ways, let's talk about unfair dismissal claims. Now, unfair dismissal claims, failure to follow. So if you fail to follow a fair process, the tri a tribunal can actually award an additional 25%. So again, and I know I've mentioned it before, but get advice from us at the beginning to reduce this risk. It's all about mitigating risk. Um, many of you may be aware already, but obviously it's employees with two years service can actually make a claim and they have a window of three months minus a day to make a claim from their last day. However, an employee does not need two years service to claim an automatic unfair dismissal. So that could be, for instance, for when they've tried to make a flexible working request or they're pregnant and have been dis um, dismissed. Discrimination claims aren't capped. Um, and they tend to be higher for disabled employees, and that's due to them, harder for them to find work. So, plus is also normally uh, injury to feelings on top that you need to be aware of. Tribunals will assess 
whether the employer's acted fairly and reasonably, uh, not whether the employee is guilty of misconduct. So another thing just to be wary of. So unfair dismissal claims typically um, could be caused by unlawful deduction from wages, so not paying notice periods um, or when dismissing them, not stating clearly the reason for dismissal, uh, not doing an investigation or even not a thorough one, so paying lip service really not providing the right to be accompanied. Remember, that's an extra two weeks on top, plus 25%. Going straight to a final um, written warning or an immediate dismissal with no previous warnings, that's actually quite a common one. Um, and also the same person doing the whole, whole process. Um, same person doing the whole process is an interesting one. Now, I appreciate that some practices may be really small, some are, some probably won't have that, but it is um, some might have that problem. But it's really important to make sure that you have as much impartiality throughout the process as possible. Um, so you might have to delegate and have one individual would do the investigation stage, where someone else would do the hearing, and again, someone else would probably be on standby in case there's an appeal on the outcome of the hearing. Now, at this stage, typically you have what's called ACAS would do an early conciliation and that's when they step in um, and you do need to work with ACAS should that happen. I'd just like to move on now to what to do. So these are all the good things. These are all the, the things that we recommend. Get a right advice at the right time to reduce the risk. I will keep banging that drum. I think it's actually probably one of the, mo the, the most important things to take away from today is think of it as um, Think of it as outsourcing the business risk. We provide a service, but make sure you contact us as early as possible. It's much, it's much better, um, I think, probably to think of it as a prevention rather than a cure. So get your recruitment checks right, train your staff on policies, on your procedures, make sure that everyone is aware of what's expected of them. And then when something should happen, make sure that you take immediate action. I think as well, don't allow your own personal dislikes of individuals or prejudices really to color your judgment. Review ACAS, have a look at the ACAS's websites. Um, you just quite easily Google uh, disciplinary procedure for ACAS and it will pop up for you just to go through. Remember to not just pay lip service. I've said this before, remember not to pay lip service to the investigation stage. Remember to be thorough take your time, make sure it's fair, In interview the individual, take as much information down as you possible so you have as many facts as possible. Um, and then finally, keep full notes of the hearing and store them securely. Um, again, whether that's hard copy or if you wanted to have a look at our iTeam solution. Right, we've looked at the do's. Let's look at the don'ts. Again, don't rush in too quickly. Take your time, think of the most appropriate course of action to take. Um, with regards to suspension, suspend an employee without careful consideration. So don't do this. And remember, it is not a signal of guilt. Don't issue any warnings without following process. So as you can see in your slide there, our disciplinary procedure is on. I comply for you to look at and for the individual. Um, as a case in point, to look at as well. Don't have the same person deal with each stage. Remember what I said, it needs to be impartial. Don't preempt the outcome of a disciplinary. Remember, no decision until afterwards. And that's quite clear, quite a key point as well. Do not dismiss an employee for a first demeanor unless obviously it's gross misconduct. So again, remember that there are stages, there's written warnings, there's a final written warning. And also when you, if you, if you are dismissing, remember they have the right to appeal. So do not dismiss without giving the right to appeal. And then just lastly for this slide, don't go it alone, seek advice. Okay, now I wanted to have, to have a look at any upcoming events. So it's tying off really now. I mean, we've had a look at what to do. We've finally had a look at what not to do. Um, this is a, a series of webinars that we are looking at different HR um, topics. So we do have another HR topic coming up next week. So make sure to join us for that webinar. 
Um, really, what other webinars would you like to look at? Are there any key burning HR topics that you'd really like someone to discuss or explain to you? So on the slide there, you'll see email your suggestions over to iteam at juliasoftware.com. Um, and yeah, we look forward to hearing from you.